It's slim pickings in AM5 for ITX, but ASRock's got the B650E Phantom Gaming ITX Wi-Fi. We're gonna take a look at the motherboard and do an easy build with it. Right out of the box, you know you got something special. We've shifted from our VRMs needing heat sinks to our PCIe 5 M.2s. Well, that's not ASRock's fault, and you don't have to run the fan if you're not running a PCIe 5 M.2, obviously. But the option is included, and it's nice if you need it. We'll talk more about the motherboard in a second. Let's take a look at the bundle that comes with the motherboard. In the box, we've got our ASRock Phantom Gaming Key with our cherry stems. I just got a fancy beam spring keyboard. This mechanism dates from the 1960s. It's a unique key switch mechanism, and yet, I'm gonna be able to use my Phantom Gaming Key right on my beam spring motherboard. That's the magic of cherry compatible switch stems. Got some ASRock Velcro straps, which is nice. Got a nice Wi-Fi antenna. It's movable. This is good. This is what every Wi-Fi antenna should be. If your Wi-Fi antenna is just two little sticks, it's not good. This is great because this lets you move it and moving it around is really important because it's Wi-Fi 802.11ax. 6E, magic, happiness. High-end Bluetooth, all the options. Let's get your installation manual walking you through your AM5 installation. And two SATA cables. Aha, and our Phantom Gaming postcard. I like the postcards. Now in terms of motherboard layout for AM5, it's a little unique. You have two M.2, those M.2 are routed directly to the CPU. They don't go through the chipset, so no matter what you're running, you're not gonna bottleneck. One of those is gonna be PCIe 5, of course. The other one is PCIe 4. Your X16 slot, also PCIe 5. You got two DDR5 DIMM slots that supports up to DDR5 6600. I was able to get 6600 stable, although you're not gonna wanna run 6600 with an AM5 CPU because it throws your fabric ratios all out and you just, you don't wanna do that yet, at least with 7000 series AM5 CPUs. But in the future, if AM5 CPUs support something beyond 6000, then you'll be able to run that with the right ratios. 6800, doable on an ITX platform. Pretty impressive. As an aside, it's actually easier to get faster memory working when you have fewer DIMM slots. With only one DIMM per channel, you could achieve insanely high rates for your memory clocks, but we don't really have a great supply of insanely fast DDR5 yet, and the microcode, the software to help enable those higher speeds, not really there yet. For other connections around the motherboard, We've got a USB 2 header, a USB 5 gigabit header, a USB type C header, so lots of external USB connectivity, two SATA 6 gigabit per second ports, a four pin fan header at the top edge of the motherboard, as well as the bottom edge of the motherboard. Two at the top are for digital RGB headers. There's a little two pin header here at the bottom in case you wonder what that is. That's for clearing the CMOS. If your system won't post, you can short that out with a jumper or a screwdriver and that will clear the settings and maybe the system will post after that. There's a front panel audio connector here at the front edge of the motherboard just above the GPU. If you've got a GPU with a really thick backplate in the test system, it was sort of, it was really close. There wasn't a lot of margin there, but you can sort of angle your audio cable up and out of the way and route it above your graphics card and that'll work okay for dealing with your front panel audio. It's ITX, I mean, things getting a little crowded. On the back of the motherboard, we have our embedded DisplayPort connector. This lets you run a display inside your case. So you might've seen the build that I did with the ASRock Live Mixer Z790. You can do that with this board exactly the same way with exactly the same LCD panels and cables, but just in an ITX form factor. It's pretty awesome. And then of course our rear M.2. Now the rear M.2 here, there's no heat sink or backplate or anything like that. So hopefully your motherboard cutout is large enough that you could run a heat sink with your M.2 if you needed to. If you can't, I recommend getting some thermal pads so that you can put your M.2 in contact with your actual case and use your case as a heat sink or your motherboard tray more specifically. For this feature set, this is a relatively no frills motherboard. It does not have a BIOS flashback function as far as I can tell. So you wanna make sure that the box and the manual has the support for the CPU you intend to run. The 7800X 3D chips just launched, and I picked this motherboard up around the 7800X 3D launch, and it did post and support the 7800X 3D. So the BIOS support for the 7800X 3D was, was there out of the box for this motherboard. In the future, down the road, you know, since the AM5 launch, we've had the non-X CPUs launch, and now the X3D CPUs launch. 
It might have been necessary to borrow a friend's CPU or go to your local computer shop to upgrade the BIOS without a BIOS flashback. It's, it's frankly a sort of a baffling omission given that AMD sort of supports that out of the box even on the B650 chipsets. They really should have put something in there for that. I'm, I'm hoping maybe I'm just wrong or there's a, a pads you can hit or something like that to enable BIOS flashback, but none of the USB ports are, are marked to uh, support BIOS flashback either or the BIOS option to do that. It does have an integrated two and a half gig NIC, 10 gigabit ports, five gigabit ports, lightning, and then four USB 2.0 ports. I like this, and if it's choice of no USB ports and USB 2 ports, I'll take four USB 2 ports at the back because I've always got slow devices like audio DACs and keyboards and mice and that sort of thing that'll chew up my otherwise really awesome five gigabit ports, meaning that I can't use them for other things. And nothing is more irritating for me than when I go to look at somebody's computer and they've got like their wireless USB dongle plugged into a 10 gigabit USB port. It's like, well, I don't have any other USB peripherals I'm using right now. And it's like, Rrr. but what if, what if someone comes to your house bearing gifts in the form of files that need to come from a 10 gigabit USB SSD? I mean, what, what are we going to do there? So at the rear, we've also got our optical SPDIF port, headphone and microphone port. Those are the only two analog ports. And that's pretty much it. I tried to also use the USB-C port as a display out to see if that was hooked up to our APU and our AM5. That doesn't seem to be the case. So no display port alt mode for you in this 10 gigabit USB port. But if that changes sometime, I mean, it's possible that it could change with the BIOS update or something like that, depending on how it's wired. I didn't spend a lot of time trying to figure that out. I'll put a pinned comment below saying, oh, BIOS update, we got the display working. But doesn't seem to work. One other cool feature that I'll mention is this four pin fan header is running to your M.2 so you can control it. But if you're not gonna use the fan for your M.2, you can take the heatsink off, put it in your, in your box. You've got another four pin fan header you could use for a case fan or anything else that you wanna run. So you could have three four pin fan headers on here if you want, but you gotta unplug your PCIe 5 heatsink with the optional fan control. There's a lot of you that are very anti-tiny fan and I get it tiny fan, it's whiny, you don't want it. Uh, you want to avoid those first generation PCI-5 SSDs probably then. For the build, we're going to be using a Cooler Master NR200 because that's really the easy button on a small form factor build. If you want to do a, a small form factor build like this and you don't have a lot of experience, it's not a lot of fun because everything is crammed together. But the Cooler Master NR200 is still, I think, the best product out there for building a small form factor machine because it's the case. And uh, a vertical mount for your GPU, which makes it a little easier to install and remove your GPU. That's PCIe 4 compatible, which is fine because there's not any PCIe 5 GPUs on the market right now. And it comes with a power supply, 850 watts in our case. And so this kit from Cooler Master really could make it any easier to build a system around this motherboard with or without the embedded display port. It's pretty awesome. Allow me to skip ahead. This is our more or less completed build in the NR200. I really wasn't kidding when I said the NR200 makes your build really easy. It's got a built-in 280 millimeter radiator in the top, which is, you know, kind of unprecedented. The build is basically drop in the processor, drop the motherboard in, probably install your memory first. We're using A-Data memory. It's the nice XPG kit, it's DDR5-6000. It's a perfect fit for this motherboard. It's relatively inexpensive. It's available pretty much everywhere. Works well with our Phantom Gaming setup. Our front panel connections on this NR200, this model, this version doesn't include USB-C. I'm not sure if they've up upgraded to include a USB-C connection. You still got the USB-C at the rear. You can use that, but it would be nice if Cooler Master had a version. The front is also removable, and this is one of the few cases you could actually use a U.2 Enterprise class drive. If you use the M.2 breakout cable that I recently showed, or even the M.2 to U.2 adapters that come with the PCIe 3 Intel Optane SSDs. You can use the rear M.2 as well as the PCIe 3 to U.2 cable to go from the back of the motherboard to the device. And there's physically enough room to mount it in the front. You've got 15 millimeters of clearance with the front panel here. So if you're gonna use a smaller drive or a drive that runs hot, you actually can get some airflow in the front. It's pretty cool. If you get creative, you can use both two and a half inch bays right at the front of the case. GPU mounting in the NR200 is a little bit of a problem if you're gonna go with the highest of the high end. An aftermarket 4090, not gonna fit. You do have three slots of vertical clearance plus a little bit, so you could even do like a three and a half slot card and it would still breathe okay. 
but the case is not physically long enough. 6900 XT, 6950 XT, our uh, OC formula from ASRock, it will fit if you get a little creative, but it's a tight fit. So check the length of the card and the length of the manual, the maximum length for the NR200, and make sure your GPU will actually fit. I went with the 7900 XT from AMD.com because it's a two and a half slot card. It's plenty powerful enough and relatively inexpensive for what it is. It'll definitely fit. Another good choice for a build like this, you know, 6600, 6650, 6750, 6800, all those will fit really well. The AMD.com reference version of the 6800 will also fit, although you can find 6800 class cards for considerably less than on the AMD website because those cards are kind of old news now and that, but eh, there you go. One thing that this motherboard has that I think is kind of a unique feature is you know how DDR5, when you first set up your system, it takes a little while for the system and the memory to get to know one another. It's the DDR5 training process to train the memory and the motherboard to made up correctly and have an error-free information exchange. Well, this motherboard has a, a blinking power light while it's doing that to let you know that it's doing something, but you know, the big black nothing that you're experiencing is not a malfunction, it's just that it's doing something to, to get it to know. It's also a pretty common question with these new kinds of builds. What's the post time? How long does it take to turn on? Well, here we go. And this is after the system is trained and the expo profile has been enabled on our A data memory. So you turn it on and it takes a couple of seconds. If you saw it blinking there, it was just like two seconds, not, not really a big deal. And then the system is gonna go ahead and turn on and post. During the initial system setup, it's gonna take, you know, 10 to 30 seconds. This is a 32 gigabyte kit and it booted up in less time than I had to ramble with that. So not bad. The out of the box profile for the M.2 fan is extremely aggressive. I've got a, uh, an M.2 SSD in there that runs really hot and the sensor that ASRock has underneath it is very aggressive about trying to keep that M.2 cool. So if you're going to run a different M.2, you could not use that heatsink, or you could use that heatsink, but you could unplug the fan as long as it's not PCIe 5. If you do that, I recommend using software like Hardware Info 64 to make sure that your M.2 is not running super hot, um, but you don't have to deal with the little tiny fan. But the little tiny fan is very effective at moving a lot of air. But as a result of that, you can definitely hear it. So it's also a thing that you can set in the BIOS in terms of a custom fan profile. So you go into the BIOS and say, hey, don't be so aggressive, little tiny fan. And as long as you keep an eye on your thermals, that's also okay. But again, the board defaults pretty aggressive with that fan. Moment of truth with our BIOS update and error correcting memory. Will it work? Will it actually support error correction? While we're waiting on that to update, we can run through a couple of settings in the BIOS. As I mentioned, the M.2 fan, it is nice to see explicit menu options say, do you want this to be a water pump? Do you want this to be the M.2 fan? Do you want to use it as a four pin fan hitter? You have that option right there in the BIOS. It knows, good job ASRock. Now while I can formerly test DDR4 error correction functionality, thanks in part to some homebrew hardware, as well as some Passmark hardware for actual hardware ECC testing, I don't have similar hardware for DDR5. I also don't have a long enough running system to just wait for DDR5 errors to accumulate, and it's probably not a great thing to have some sort of uh, source of radioactive decay, which will help flip bits uh, when located close to the motherboard. As far as where a fuser in the basement, nah, it doesn't work that way. You know, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not, that's perfectly harmless radiation as opposed to, but I digress. It is reporting a data width of 72 bits when we run DMI decode-t. You will need a newer Linux kernel uh, in order for the EDAC to initialize correctly. I do see some messages in the kernel about the EDAC initializing on the six series kernels, so that's probably a good sign. It seems like error correction is working based on those pieces of information, 72 bits wide, EDAC, the fact that the EDAC initializes and so on and so forth, and it posts. Look, we're already miles ahead of other AM5 boards when we're talking about 
error correcting unregistered un unregistered unbuffered error correcting ddr5 memory in that this is the latest version of the bios as of the end of april 2023 for our phantom gaming ipx motherboard the motherboard continues to post and i have positive looking messages in the linux kernel if the ECC is not working, this is still the most positive result for error correcting DDR5 5200 memory on planet Earth so far. Good job, Azrock. Also want to call out again, the extra 2.0 USB ports at the back. A lot of the time with these mid tier and higher ITX systems, you really feel like you're missing out because you don't get as many USB ports as your desktop counterparts. And even though these are USB 2 ports, I mean, more USB 3 ports, 5, 10, 20 gigabit would, would be welcome, obviously. But that makes the board a lot more complicated, potentially a lot more expensive. Just having the extra 2.0 ports, I'll take it. And the overall situation with USB is I've got one unpopulated USB 2.0 header. So I've got two ports internally that I'm not using, as well as my USB Type-C header that I mentioned before. That might be worth buying a USB Type-C breakout and then just getting creative with how I route that Type-C cable to the outside because, uh, you know, you can always use an extra USB port. If you find yourself one USB port short, there's options. Let's put a quick look at our ASRock Phantom Gaming B650 ITX. It is a competent AM5 board. Oh, and in case you're wondering, will it work with the 16 core? Yes, if you wanted to run the 7950X with this board, you can. The VRMs will get a little toasty, especially if you enable PBO. I don't know that I would recommend this board for PBO, but you're going to see a VRM temperature in this case of about 95 degrees C under sustained load with the 7950. Gaming workload, you're probably not going to touch 90 degrees C, and that is our worst case scenario. For a CPU like the 7700X or the 7800X 3D or even the 7950X 3D, you're not gonna hit 90 degrees C on your VRM in this case, because it's got reasonable airflow. I'm Wendell, this is Level One. I'm signing out. You can find me in the Level One forums.